Good morning, church. Happy Sunday. Yeah. We are so excited to be online with you this morning. We are all about people here. So let me tell you what our mission statement is. It's inviting everyone in our influence to experience full life in Jesus. And we hope that becomes your mission too. Absolutely. As Crystal mentioned, we are all about community here, right? So if this is maybe your first or second time here, there will be a number that comes across the screen. When you see that, just text us a quick hi. We'd love to get you connected. All right, well, we're gonna go ahead and jump right in, get into worship. So take a deep breath, set all your distractions aside, and let's get into the presence of God. It's gonna be amazing, so let's go. I will sing of your goodness, I will sing of your love, though the seasons come quickly, you have always been enough, though the night may get darker, though the waiting seems long, you have always been faithful to remind me of your love. morning I say you are good in the evening I say you are good you are good to me you have always been patient you have always been kind you're consistent through the ages Oh, what a friend of mine So I'll remind myself to bless you Standing firm upon your truth Knowing you cannot be shaken Cause I've seen what you can do Oh, you are good In the morning I'll say you are good In the evening I'll say you Sing that with us. You keep on getting better. 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 Oh, oh. you keep on getting better. You keep on getting better. Yes, you do. You keep on getting better. You keep on getting better. Come on, church, sing it out. You keep on getting better. You keep on. sing it straight to his heart today oh you are good in the morning i say you are good in the evening i say you are good you are 
sing this next song and just tell him, church, who he is. You know, we can be so distracted by all the worries of the world, just like Pastor Jeff talked about last week. But you know, the moment that we take our focus off of our worry, and we put it back on our King, on our Savior, and we begin to tell him who he is, he breaks that worry off of our lives. And I want to tell you something this week as I've been getting ready to lead this song, as we've been getting ready to lead this song, the, the bridge of this song kept coming back to me. You know, we've been in this season for a long time now. It's been about six months. And even though it seems like forever, and even though you may feel like, I don't know what God's doing. I don't know where he is and I keep worrying about all of these things, the bridge of this song says, even when I don't see it, he's working. And I'm holding on to that today, just for me personally, but I want you to know that because if you have had a tough week, if you're having a tough day, sing these words as a declaration that even though you don't see it, even if you don't feel it, that our God, is a way maker. He's a promise keeper. And he is going to make a way even if you don't see it. He is working. Come on, let's sing. You are here moving in our midst. I worship you. I worship you. You are here Working in this place, I worship you, I worship you. You are here, you're moving in our midst. I worship you, I worship you. You are here, working in I worship you, I worship you, cause you are way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are, you are way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, Light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. You are here, you're touching every heart. I worship you, I worship you. You are here, you're healing every heart. I worship Who you are, that is who 
you're working Cause even when I feel it, you're working You'll never stop, you'll never stop working You'll never stop, you'll never stop working Cause even when I don't see it, you're working even when I don't feel it, you're working You'll never stop, you'll never stop working you know, Come on church, we sing that together Cause even when I don't see it, you're working Even when I don't feel it, you're working Never stop, you never stop working you never stop, you never stop working Even when I don't see it, you're working even when I don't feel it, you work it. You never stop, you never stop working. You are waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness of my God. That is who you are. You are waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light. Darkness of my God, that is who you are. You are, you are, you are. Way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness of my God, that is who you are. You are, way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. are so good and you are so faithful. We thank you that you never fail us. You never leave us no matter what season we're in. And we just thank you for who you are. We love you in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. That's right. So, hey, church, listen, if you happen to join us while we were in worship, we want to take a moment to, to say hello. <laughs> it's great to see you. So take a quick moment if you could and drop a hi in the chat box so we know you're here. And guess what? It is time. We are going to have in-person services starting today at 11 a.m. every Sunday. 
<laughs> That's right. So if you are ready to come back to church, we cannot wait to see your smiling faces. So now there are some guidelines around this. So we want to take a couple moments to let you know what those are. Babe, tell us about them. Yeah, so if you have elementary age kids, continue to watch C3 Kids online at home. We will get your whole family back in in phase three. You also need to register. You can go to our website to do that. It's real easy. It starts at 8 p.m. tonight. So make sure you get on right at eight and reserve yourself a spot. We're gonna be wearing masks and social distancing so that you feel super safe coming back and we can't wait to see your face. That's right. So details on all of this, if you have any questions about any of that, when you go to register and you go to sign up, all the information about the guidelines are sitting right there on the website. Yeah, and we can't wait to see you in person. Absolutely. So church, Let's get ready to give. It is that time. So I have a quick verse I want to just hopefully encourage you with out of, uh, this is 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 12, and this is the New Living Translation. It says this, Whatever you give is acceptable if you give it eagerly, and give according to what you have, not what you don't have. Man, this verse to me is just such an awesome reflection of God's heart after us. You remember, remember when Jesus said, when the, uh, when the widow dropped the two, the two coins into the offering bucket and he said, man, she gave more than everybody. God's not after what you don't have. He's after your heart and he's after your participation according to what you have to give, not to what you don't. So let that be an encouragement this week as you prepare your tithes and offerings. Well, after service, we have Zoom lobbies. Yeah. And what those are is just a few minutes uh, where we all get on Zoom and we get to see each other's face. You get in a room with about four or five people and have some good conversations. So make sure awesome. you click on that. We'd love to see you after the service. Absolutely. So church, it is that time. I hope you are ready because a great message is coming from Pastor Jeff. So top off that coffee, sweeten it up if you need to, grab your grab your pen, your, your notebook, just make sure that you are ready to go, let's dive in. Hey everybody, welcome back to C3 Online Church, man. So excited you joined us today. We've got a great message lined up for you. In this COVID season that things keep changing, I, I, I got good news for you. Church is back in session this week. If you can join us live, you can do that, but I'm so excited about all of you that are sticking with us online. And today, I've got a fantastic message for you. As our seasons keep changing, church is going back to in-person services for those of you that live in Lawrenceville, but school's going back too for a lot of our kids here in Gwinnett County. Lots of reboots, lots of restarts from maybe where we thought we would be now to where we are today. And there's a great opportunity in that. Gotta keep seeing those opportunities we have in this season to take a hold of what God has for us. And so in, in these new seasons, one of the great things we can do is set goals for our life. Any leadership teaching you see or, or you follow will tell you one of the greatest things we can do is set goals so we don't kind of wander around in our lives without getting to any particular point getting to any particular defining line for our lives. But if we'll set goals out in front of us and we'll live our lives towards those end, we'll find our lives far more fulfilling. But, but if you're like most of us, it, it, it comes and goes in our world, that, that season of setting goals and not setting goals. But, but you know, we all, we all do those things kind of subconsciously. And so my question for you this week is, is what do you want? It's an incredibly profound question when we dig into human nature and we, and we begin to look into the Word of God. It's an incredibly profound question, but it's one I think we don't ask ourselves, not on a greater level. Maybe like, what do you want for lunch? We ask ourselves those questions every day, but, but on a broader level, do we really ask ourselves, hey, what is it in a broader scope of our lives? What is it that we want? I want to walk through some scriptures with you today to help you see how Jesus handled this idea. And, and I was actually surprised when I, when I dove into scripture to see this because right in the beginning of John's gospel, right at the very start of this thing, Jesus poses this question. In fact, it's the first thing he says. And so I wanna walk with you through John chapter one, starting in verse 35. And what we'll see is that John in chapter one is just kind of given this incredible narrative description of who God is and how he's been uh, since the beginning of time and created all things. And then we have a short story about John the Baptist. And then we introduce Jesus onto the scene and right after that, his disciples. Let's see what's happening in that section of this scripture 
First, not sorry, John 1, 35 through 42 says this. It says, the following day, John the Baptist was again standing with two of his disciples. As Jesus walked by, John looked at him and declared, look, there is the Lamb of God. When John's two disciples heard this, they followed Jesus. Jesus looked around and saw them following. What do you want? He asked them. They replied, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? Come and see, he said. It was about four o'clock in the afternoon when they went with him to the place where he was staying and they remained with him the rest of the day. Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of these men who heard what John said and then followed Jesus. Andrew went to find his brother Simon and told him, we found the Messiah, which means Christ. When Andrew brought Simon to meet Jesus, looking intently at Simon, Jesus said, your name is Simon, son of John but you will be called Cephas, which means Peter. Man, just imagine this moment. You know, these, these, these two disciples, Andrew and probably John, are, are, are disciples of John the Baptist, and they're already a part of this radical ministry in first century Jerusalem. Like, they're already a part of this radical ministry in Israel that's, that's declaring this new season is coming, and John is baptizing people for the forgiveness of sins, and, and it's, it's a revolution in their world. And then one day their teacher says, look, there goes the Lamb of God. And clearly from all the commentaries I read, John the Baptist's intention here is to point his disciples. He does the right thing. He knows that Jesus is the greater prophet. He's the greater man. I don't think he recognizes that he's the son of God just yet, but he recognizes that this is the man they should be following. And so he points out Jesus to his disciples. And his disciples do, of course, what you'd expect. His disciples go and they begin to follow Jesus. And as they follow him, he turns around. Just imagine this. It's like, you know, staring at the sun. It's like a play on words, but almost not. Because this idea that they're staring at the Lamb of God, they're staring this man in the face who represents all of their aspirations, all of their hopes, all of their identity as Israelites. They're staring this man in the face and he turns to them and he says, what do you want? I mean, how do you handle that moment when the Son of God looks at you in the face and says, what do you want? How do you answer? You know, the, the irony here is that Jesus actually gives them a minute because they don't know how to answer. And maybe that's a wise move on their part. He invites them to come and see, come and be a part of what he's doing. And he, Jesus, in, in classic Jesus form, has enough grace and mercy for these two men who, who stumbled onto his ministry to allow them to spend the day with them before they make any kind of decision. And we know from other gospels that Jesus once again calls them in a different setting and they finally make the permanent decision to follow him. But this is the introduction. And so I wanna ask you, like, how would you handle that? How would you handle this idea that the son of God is asking you, what do you want? You ever been sitting around with friends, maybe, you know, hanging around your living room at night and just, you know, having some good conversation and, and you start dreaming a little bit together, maybe someone throws out, hey, if you could go anywhere in the world, where would you wanna go? Or, hey, if you won the lottery, what's the first thing you would buy? Or what would you do with a million dollars? You know, kind of just philosophical, fun questions like that. But somebody, you know, sometimes asks a kind of a serious question. And in this setting, in church, I'm asking you, you know, we're friends, we've been doing this together for a long time. And, and, and as a church, we're a family. What do you want? It's kind of easy when you're logged on to C3 Church Online and you're watching a sermon. What do you want? We know the textbook answer, but you know when you when you give the kind of textbook answer in your living room at night, with you, when you're hanging out with your friends, you give the textbook answer, you know that they don't take that for anything. They're like, oh yeah, 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 yeah. Tell us what you'd really do. Tell us what you really want. Don't give us the answer that you know we want to hear. Give us the answer that's really deep down in your heart as if the right answer couldn't possibly be your actual heart. Well, as I ask you this question today, know that as Jesus appears on the scene in John, it's the first question he poses to his followers, and he's gonna pose it to you every day for the rest of your life. What do you want? And so as the textbook answers come into our minds about 
what we'd say in response to that kind of a question. Maybe you've never considered it before. I'd invite you to write it down right now. Jesus said to me, what do you want? How do I answer that question? It would be worth your time, especially if you're working from home and you've got a little non-commute time on your hands. To take some time today, tomorrow, it, it might take you a couple of days to consider what your answer is. Remember I asked you a tattoo? I didn't ask you actually to, ta- ask you to consider what you would tattoo, not actually make, give a tattoo on your forearm. Saying, hey, if, if you could just have one reminder, one word that would remind you to follow God every day, what one word would you tattoo on your forearm? It's the same kind of exercise here. What do you want? Jesus is asking you right here, right now today, what do you want? How do we respond to that profound question from the ultimately profound man of God? Well, C.S. Lewis gives us, I'm going to give you two C.S. Lewis stories today because he does such a good job of taking these biblical concepts and breaking them down into what I think are great examples. C.S. Lewis said this in his book, Miracles. He said, there comes a moment when the children who've been playing at burglars hush suddenly. Was that a real footstep in the hall? There comes a moment when the people who've been dabbling with religion, man search for God, suddenly draw back. Supposing we really found him. We never meant it would come to that. We're still supposing he found us. So it's sort of a line of ultimate decision. One goes across or not. But if one does, one may be in for anything. Imagine these first century disciples. Get out of your head for a minute. Get out of the scriptures for a minute and get in your imagination. God gave you your imagination so that you could use it to to, to get these ideas across, to get these concepts into your heart, out of your head and into your heart. How would you feel knowing what you know about what these disciples are about to go through? Their first century journey with Jesus is going to blow every expectation. They literally have no idea what they're in for. They can't imagine the, the, the opportunity, the, the, the life experience, the miracles, the walking on water and sinking at the same time experiences they are about to have with Jesus if they answer this question, we want to follow you. Of course, that's how both of these men answer it. And the rest of their lives are impacted. The rest of their lives are affected in the most brilliant of ways. They couldn't even conceive of the life that was to follow, but they knew. They knew what the answer needed to be. And I want to invite you to explore that answer with me in this sermon. So explore that answer for ourselves so that we can answer it right today, tomorrow, and for the rest of our lives, that our lives say almost every week, because it's the mantra, it's the vision of our church, that my life and your life might be the kind of lives that Jesus planned, not only for these disciples, but for us as disciples as well. That life and life more abundant that he came to give each and every one of us. So we need to do a hard exam because the reality is, even if we don't set goals for ourselves, all of us are going in a direction. You can't get off of this moving sidewalk called life. We're all headed for some kind of a destination, whether we want to or not. There's, there's two kinds of people in the world, though. There's the kind of people that know where they're going and the kind of people that are kind of walking in random directions. We want to be the people who know where we're going. And listen, maybe you haven't set goals for your life. Maybe you haven't set goals for 2020 or 2021. And even if you set them for 2020, I mean, they've probably been blown up 15 times by the circumstances of the year. But here's the thing that I want to do. I want to do a little heart exam for a minute. We started this last week. I want to bring it around again this week because ultimately what you want is going to determine the direction of your life. Whether you mean for it to or not, your heart, your life, your mind, your money, your focus is going to go towards what it is that you want. And some of us maybe consciously understand what that want is, but I think for most of us, that kind of a deep-seated want stays hidden in our subconscious, and we often move in directions we don't even realize life is taking us. But we don't want to live a life that's guided left and right by our circumstances. We wanna live a life that takes a hold of the reins and 
and goes down the road that God has for every single one of us. So let me walk through these self-examination questions I asked you last week. Let's walk through them again real quickly because I want you to really answer these questions so you can get a hold of your heart, get a hold of your wants, and then let's make sure that your life is on the directional track that God has for you to be on. Here's the, here's the questions for you. Now listen, let's not settle. Let's not give textbook answers here. Let's examine our hearts. I know what the answers are meant to be in church. Let's examine our hearts and see what the real answers are on your Tuesday mornings, your Wednesday nights. Because ultimately, these are waypoints and we can make adjustments. There's no judgment here. This is so we can get our life on the best track possible. Let's be honest so that we can make sure that by the end of this message, we've got some great ideas of how to get our life on an even better track than maybe it's on right now. Here's the questions. Number one, what do we want most? Kind of already asked that one, didn't I? Let's examine that as a, as a real core fundamental question. Number two, what do we think about the most? What we think about is a reflection of what our heart wants. Number three, how do we use our money? Man, I'm telling you, there are cultures where that's not such a big deal, but in America, that's a huge deal. What do we do with our money to find so much of what we want? How do we spend our leisure time? What do we do with our leisure time? Man, your default mode kind of comes up to the surface in your leisure time, and so much of what you want, what you truly live your life for is guided by what happens in that leisure time. What company do we enjoy the friends we hang around, the people that we associate with? And lastly, who and what do we admire? Oftentimes they've got their life on a direction towards a want that we respect, towards a want that we wanna imitate. So we, we use their life as a model and that's why we admire them, that's why we respect them. So we wanna make sure that we, we take those those questions serious and we actually provide real world answers instead of just textbook explanations. But as we review these questions again this week, these self-examination kind of questions, I want to explore the idea of what it is that you want, what it is your heart is directed towards, because ultimately that's the direction our life is going to go. So let's go through these questions real quickly again, and let's not give textbook answers, but let's have real world, real life kind of answers, our Tuesday night, our Wednesday morning kind of answers for each one of these questions. Let's run through them. You've already seen them. We'll put them on the screen. Let's run through, run through them real quickly. First one, it's kind of like a, a circular question here. What do we want most? Of course, that's the kind of where we're trying to get to. If you know the answer, fantastic. If you don't, allow these next few questions to help you define that. What do you think about the most? What's on your mind? What grabs your attention? Is often a, a subconscious reflection of what your heart is ultimately after. How do we use our money? You know, there are cultures where that's not that important, but in America, it's incredibly important. How we use our money so often is a reflection of our heart, our wants. How do we use our money and how does that define what it is that we want? What do we do with our leisure time? And that's like your, your default mode. It's like your autopilot. When all the other features are turned off, where is the plane going of your life? We can get a lot of good information about what's on our hearts, what's in our minds, what, our, what are our wants in our leisure time? Who, what company do we enjoy? Who are we hanging out with? We'll hang out oftentimes with people that share our wants, that share uh, our hearts. And the last thing is, who do you admire? Who do you respect? because those people probably share your wants too. You respect them because you see them on a pathway that you would like to be on. And a lot of times that can help be a reflection of our wants. Why is that important? Because ultimately, you know, it determines the direction of your life and what you want is what you're going to worship. What you direct your heart towards is ultimately whatever gets in your heart that stands above in priority and prominence above the plan of God for your life, above the person of Jesus for your life, whatever that is, whether you want to or not, you're worshiping that thing. And so we wanna step those things back in our hearts and allow the word of God, allow the priority of Jesus to rise in our worlds so we can take a hold of the light that he has for every single one of us. We saw what happened in the disciples. We gotta be ready for anything. And listen, if you're honest with these answers, we can recalibrate 
in the rest of this message. If we, can, if we can get a hold of our hearts right now, we can recalibrate the map of our life and get back on a great direction again. So don't be discouraged. Don't be in despair. No matter what the answer is, what we need is honesty so that we can get this direction going again. These disciples, remember, Jesus gave them the afternoon. He gave them the day. We don't actually know when they left the area, when they had to leave their nets and their boats and go follow him for good. But in this moment, Jesus says, come and see. Let's take the time he's giving us. Today, we have grace. Today, we have mercy. Today, we have a moment to make a decision to make a shift in these things, let's use the opportunity so that we can answer yes to the question at the end of this message and we can set our life on the direction God has for us to go. So where do our hearts find us today? We gotta know because that's the direction we're walking in. And the direction we're walking in is the direction that our wants are taking us. And, And ultimately what we want is what we're going to worship So it's a really important question. Am I heading towards a great goal? Am I heading towards a godly goal? Or am I worshiping something else? Is there something else getting in the way? You know, a lot of times we we, we just forget, honestly, the direction we're meant to go in. You know, if you read early stories about explorers, there are all kinds of stories out there about explorers and, and early maps of the new world or of, or, or of the old world that were just completely wrong. There's stories that even in the last century, there are islands and and markers on maps that simply don't exist. In fact, they used to, some of these map makers used to put towns and, and, and features on their maps that actually didn't exist as kind of copyright markers. And they would know if anyone copyrighted, if anyone copied that map and, and sold it on their own, they, they would know they copied their map because the, the towns and cities and rivers and, and, and there's a whole, mountain range in Africa called the Kong Mountains. I don't know if that's where King Kong came from, but for a hundred years, explorers came back writing about their expedition in the Kong Mountains. It, It never even existed before. And for so many of us, the wants that are guiding our hearts, the wants that are directing our lives, our wants based on dreams, based on worlds that don't even exist in life. And we have to recalibrate our hearts so we can get our lives back in the direction God meant for them to go. So let's talk about that for a minute. How can we recalibrate our hearts? Let's say that that we've got this idea, what do you want? Jesus is asking us a question, we're ready to answer, but we know that today, maybe we're not calibrated just right yet. Maybe we're not sure that, that our lives reflect the right answers today, and that's okay. It's it's not about being right, it's about being real so we can get back to right again. So let me give you three ways you can recalibrate your heart. Three ideas that'll help you get back on God's plan and purpose for your life. Because if we're gonna reset in this season, if your kids are going back to school, maybe you're going back to work, things are shifting again. I know for us, we're going back to church on Sundays, like I mentioned, we're recalibrating some things. It's a great opportunity to take a hold again and set your life back on the direction that God has for you to go. So let's talk about that. Three ways to recalibrate your heart. Number one, get to know who God is. Talked about his word last week. I wanna talk about his character and nature this week. Imagine Simon, imagine Andrew, imagine John making this decision to follow Jesus, making this decision to follow the man of God that they thought was gonna bring revolution, God's revolution to the world. If he's asking you, what do you want? And you're about to say, to follow you. Just imagine what they must have thought about the God they were serving. What their thoughts must have been about this this supernatural being that created all things. They were Israelites. They believed that they had called them his people and that they were seeking after him and worshiping him with their whole lives. Imagine what they must have thought about him to devote their lives to him. Because in this moment, there's nothing short of that on offer. And listen, no matter what you've heard about the God that we serve, no matter what you've heard about the God of the Bible, I want you to understand his goodness, his mercy, and his love have gotten all of us here so far. And he loves us so much that he's chasing 
after you. He's chasing after me again. And every time I open his word, he opens up my heart. Every time I turn my life back to him, he's willing to meet me again. Listen, the first thing we can do in recalibrating our hearts is understanding who this God is who created all the heavens and all the earth, but in Ephesians calls you and I his masterpiece. The God who created everything thinks that way about you. And if you can get that in your spirit, he's not an angry God. He's not a judgmental God. He's a God that has had ultimate patience with his people for, for thousands of years and still is ready to allow us to turn our lives back to him so that he can become our father once again. That's how good he is. So let's change our attitude about God because that will shift the desires of our heart. Number two, recognize who he created you to be. I mean, again, think of these early disciples in, in John chapter one, like th their world is already, they're already upending their world for God. Just imagine, like they were fishermen, they were average guys doing daily tasks. We know that, that, that Peter, at least Simon in this story, had a family to feed. He, he was an average guy, he was a fisherman, he was just working for a living, but on the side, he was serving God. Why? Because he knew how, how incredibly gracious God was to call these people, the Israelites, to be a light to the world. And he knew from reading the stories of his ancestors that he was called by God to be a part of that. He understood that, that his life was meant to be something far greater than his own personal relationship with God, that he was called to be about this people of God. And so as he gets an invitation, his heart's already directed towards the hope of his nation. The, his heart's already directed towards the hope of a people. His heart's already directed to the restoration that this loving God we talked about in number one considered him and his friends and his family worth including in the plan of redemption for all of mankind. In recalibrating our hearts, it helps us to understand who God is and who God says that we are, his sons and his daughters, who he loves enough to send his son to bring us home again. And the last thing, if we wanna recalibrate our hearts to make sure we answer this question the way we need to answer it, the last thing we do is we understand God's plan for his people and for creation. Because it's one thing to understand who he is, it's another thing to understand who we are, but now we have to understand the way in which we would walk, the way in which we would live our lives, that the plans and purposes of our life would come into alignment with God, come into alignment with all that he had. So we know who he is, we know who we are, and then we know how to walk forward together to be this light to the world, to be this image of God among our coworkers, among our families, among our tennis teams, that we can become the people that are not just being who God created us to be, but we're actually going out and doing the good works that God, the Bible says, created in advance for us to do. Because as we live out our faith, that's where we find that ultimate fulfillment. So we understand that God loves us immensely, that he cares enough to include us in his plan, and that he's prepared for every single one of us these great works to do to bring hope back to mankind. Man, I hope that today I can convey that to you in a way that grabs your heart. Because if you can get those things, not just in your head, but move them down into your heart, Man, the recalibration that can happen in your world, man, will make a huge difference in your life. Does our life line up with those objectives? God's nature, my creation, and his plan for us to do this thing together. I'll tell you, it's huge. And it's critical we get things right. It's critical we get this answer right, because look at what happens. I, I don't want to leave the scriptures. I want to go back to John 1. Look what happens. They, they, they follow him for the day, and Andrew, Man, he's so excited, his heart's already recalibrated that he starts to share this good news that God has come to restore his people. And he does the first thing that I think all of us would do. We go grab our family. He gets his brother, Simon, and he brings him into the mix. Now listen, Andrew's got no idea about the future that's in store for these disciples. John's got no idea about what's gonna happen on the other side of this decision. But when Peter comes, Peter who we know will be the head of the early church, when Peter comes, it says that Jesus looked at him intently 
And he says, your name is Simon, but you will be called Peter. Jesus changes his whole identity in the first handshake, in the first conversation as Jesus receives Peter. It says he looks at him intently. It wasn't just a casual conversation. It was a stop moment in that meeting. And he says, Simon, I know who you are, but I also knew who you're going to be. It's crazy important that we get this right because as we answer Jesus with, I will follow you, He's gonna change our whole identity. And to put icing on that cake and to try to make that real and get it from your head into your heart. Let me give you this story. I'm gonna end on this. I'm gonna give you some encouragement for your week. I'm gonna end on this. Listen to what C.S. Lewis says. I've read this to you before. If you've been a member of our church for a long time, I'm gonna read it to you again because I think it's brilliant. This is how C.S. Lewis describes for us in terms we can understand what God wants to do in our worlds. He says this, in his book, Mere Christianity. He says, imagine yourself as a living house. God comes in to rebuild that house. At first, perhaps, you can understand what he's doing. He is getting the drains right and stopping the leaks in the roof and so on. You knew that those jobs needed doing and so you're not surprised. But presently, he starts knocking the house about in a way that hurts and does not seem to make any sense. What on earth is he up to? The explanation is that he's building quite a different house from the one you thought of. Throwing out a new wing here, putting on an extra floor there, running up towers, making courtyards. You thought you were going to be made into a decent little cottage, but he's building a palace. He intends to come and live in himself. Listen, what Jesus tells Peter as Jesus redefines his entire identity in this first moment of meeting Jesus wants to do for every single one of us, and it will begin in ways that we totally understand, but he will progress to taking our lives to places we never imagined possible. And as he does this, you've got to know, because remember, we understand that God ultimately loves us and has created us to be his masterpiece, his good news, his light to all creation. We've got to understand that ultimately when we get to this end, when he's finished knocking about our house, it's good news that he does far more than we ever could have asked for or imagined. The, the result is a life and a life more abundant. John 10, 10 again says a rich and satisfying life. So no matter where you are, no matter where you've been, as we answer this question, the good news for you, the good news for me, is that God wants a relationship with us right here, right now, today. And it's on offer for you and for me. And as, as we gather here together, we are his church. We are his people. And so we invite you not only to become a member of this community, but also to be one who's called by his name, to raise your hand as Jesus says, what do you want? And say, I will follow you. Listen, for you today, that may be the first time you ever make that decision, but listen, for every single one of us, we need to make that decision again. Because his people who are called according to his name, we're called the church. And listen, you've joined us today, but I need you to know that as we meet, start meeting back in person again, and as you maybe join our online campus here, I need you to know that we're not perfect. We don't get everything right, and we're still people, every single one of us. We have good days and we have bad days. We'll have to apologize oftentimes, but our heart is like your heart, and so our direction is like your direction. We want our lives to be, like I hope after hearing this message, you want your life to be that rich and satisfying life that's on offer. But we can't do it alone. God hasn't called us just individually. He's called us to be a people who are called according to his name. And so we do this life together, sharpening one another, bearing one another's burdens, and moving forward together to take a hold of all the good things God has for us on the other side of this answer, that God has for us on the other side of what do you want? Right now, I want to pray for you. I'm going to ask God to touch every one of our lives and give us a recalibration in our hearts to we'll be able to follow him the way we know he wants us to. Come on, let's pray together right now. Father, I thank you so much 
God, for your love and for your grace and for your mercy that finds us at your feet again. Father, thank you so much that you haven't given up on us. God, thank you that you bear with us and you invite us again to be a part of your plan, a part of your purpose here on earth. Father, as we make the answer to you today that yes, we want to follow you, God, help us to live the lives that you've called us to live. Father, send your Holy Spirit to empower us to do all those good works that you planned in advance for us to do. God, even as in, we're in this unprecedented season, Father, redeem us and set us up in every community we go into to be a light for your name's sake. God, we love you, we thank you, and we believe in advance that you're able to do all these things that you say you can do with my life, with every life watching today. We love you and thank you in Jesus' name, amen. Hey guys, you know, fantastic. I hope you make a decision today to say, yes, I'll follow you, Jesus, because that decision begins a journey to a rich and satisfying life, and you will not for one moment regret that answer. Yes, God, I'll follow you. You know, maybe you've never said, Jesus be Lord of my life before. God is merciful, he's gracious, he's loving, but he also, he's Lord of our life. That's why he can go about banging in that house like C.S. Lewis said. He can go out adding things onto our world that we weren't ready for because we don't just accept his love and grace and mercy, we also accept his Lordship. Maybe you've never done that before. Maybe you never said, Jesus, I wanna remove all the other wants, all the other priorities out of my life and put you on top. But right now you have an opportunity to do that. In just a moment, we've made it really easy for you. Just take your heart and say these words in a prayer to God, just you and him together as the worship team for our prayers just for this last song. And as we get ready to go into the next part, the next phase of our service, we're gonna stop, give you an opportunity to pray this prayer, just you and God, and invite him to not just be God, but to be the Lord of your life today. Come on, make that decision today, be the best day of your life. Hey church, so glad you joined us. Have a great week. that prayer. We are so excited for you. You've made an amazing decision and we'd love to stand with you and resource you. So make sure you text the number on the screen below. We'd love to get in touch with you. And if you need prayer, we also have people standing by in the chat boxes who would love to pray with you. That's right. Hey church, quick note. If you logged on this morning and you happen to think, what happened? Did I miss something? I feel like I missed 30 minutes. Well, our service times have changed. So from today forward, online services are at 9 a.m. and 11 a.m. on our Facebook and website. Make sure also that you're following us on social media so that you can always keep up with, with the latest updates and also see things like past sermons and weekly encouragements. 
All right, church, well, that's it for us. Service is over. We hope you have a fantastic week and we are praying for you and we can't wait to see you next week online or in person. Make sure you head on out to our Zoom lobbies, click the link in the chat box and we'll see you there. Have a great week.